Good morning. We are so excited that you are here. Uh, we are Bedrock Fishtown, a new church in Fishtown, Philadelphia. Uh, my name is Brian Taylor, and I'm an elder here at Bedrock. You're tuning in today to our first ever live stream. So it's an exciting moment for us as a church to be able to uh, begin worshiping through God's Word being proclaimed on Sunday mornings. And so if you'd like to join us uh, today and, and moving forward, we start at 930 and we will be um, in a new series over the next couple of weeks called Identity, How God's Design Gives Us Purpose. That, that series is going to be something where we uh, talk about the heartbeat of Bedrock Fishtown and how that's connected to a vision uh, that's rooted in God's Word. Uh, we're going to talk about our vision being uh, create a culture and continue a legacy. And what does that mean? What are the values that we hold as a church? Uh, so we'd love for you to join in and, and learn more about uh, Bedrock Fishtown through that way. Uh, we'd also love for you to connect with us, whether it's uh, through the live stream, chatting in uh, during our services, whether it's uh, checking out our website, bedrockfishtown.com. Our, our Instagram, we're constantly um, sending updates there. It's uh, at bedrockfishtown. Uh, and then it, you can call us or text us at 610-233-1330. Uh, we'd love to connect. We are a community here in Fishtown, um, and uh, we are excited that you're joining us today. I'd like to just pray for us as we open up God's Word, as we uh, talk about how God's design gives us purpose. So let's pray. Dear Father, we are uh, just humbled and excited um, to, to proclaim uh, your truth uh, this morning. We ask that you would, uh, through your spirit, speak to hearts, that you would, uh, Lord, help us to uh, truly uh, see your, um, your, your purpose that you give us for our lives and how, how we can live in light of that. God, may you uh, bless Drew as he speaks, uh, and may you, um, Lord, just continue to help uh, as we, uh, a new church, just desire for you to be glorified today. In your name, amen. Good morning. I am Drew. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. We're excited that you're here. Um, we are excited about what Sunday morning means for us. Uh, it's a chance for us to gather around the Word. We believe that the Word is placed at the center of everything that we do, both personally and corporately. So as we gather this morning, we gather around the Word, but the goal isn't to gather. The goal is to be sent. So we gather to worship, but we also are sent out of here to live worship-filled lives a life that is built on the foundation of the gospel and is fruitful for the kingdom of God. So with that in mind, can you turn to Genesis 1.1? We're going to start in the beginning. If you have your Bibles, if you don't have a Bible, you can download one on the ESV app if anyone's got a smartphone. Um, but if you do not have a smartphone, um, there's a number that's going to be at the bottom of the screen. It's 610-233-1330. Um, and you can shoot us a text. If you live in Philly, we would love to give you a Bible. I can't promise that it's going to be to you by the end of the video, but we would love to get you a Bible. Um, I want to start with this. Uh, I think something that we have grown, grown very connected to as a culture is our, our phones, our devices. I, have, I grabbed um, the oldest iPhone product that I could find. This is actually in an iPod. Um, but I was reading an article recently that was written in the New York Times, and it was titled, Steve Jobs Never Intended Us for you to Use Our Phones This Way. And this is how it started. It said, smartphones are our constant companions. For many of us, their glowing screens are ubiquitous presence, drawing us into the en endless diversions, like warm ping of social media approval delivered from the forms of likes and tweets, the algorithmic amplified outrage of the latest breaking news or controversy, they're in our hands as soon as we wake and command our attention until the final moment before we fall asleep. Steve Jobs would not approve. I don't know, have you ever thought about your phone and thought, what was it designed for? What was this thing made for? And I think, I don't know what Steve Jobs would say about the way that we use his creation. But I, I do know that when he first launched it, what he said, what he launched it as, his vision for it was that it was the best iPod that he had ever made. And that the best app on it was that it would make phone calls. And when they asked him 
about the internet. He actually didn't get into speaking about the internet until 30 minutes into his presentation. He didn't see it as that significant of a part of the product. And when they said, what about third party apps? He was like, well, I honestly think that his quote was that he was convinced that the, the phone's carefully designed native features were enough. And you're like, man, I think, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what he would say about where we're at with these phones. Um, but I don't know that he quite designed them to be a part of us the way that they are. I don't know how he would feel about the way that they've changed us. I think we can all agree that we've gone past the original design and purpose of it. Cal Newport, who wrote the articles, he argues just that. He thinks that it would be much better if we would get back to Jobs. Original design and vision for the phone. This is what I know. I, I, I don't know... I don't know where, where as, as a culture, and we look at our phones, I know it's a silly illustration, um, and it, but it's an extremely complex device. Um, we as people are much, much more complex. And I think we deserve the same question. We all ask this question of what are we supposed to do in life? And I think a good place to start is the beginning, where you ask this question to yourself, what was I designed for? And what if I told you that I could tell you exactly what you were made for. You may be like, you don't know me. And I would say, that's fair, I probably don't. Or you, you may say, you know what, I've been looking for that my entire life. And, and so, shoot. Well, wh whatever you say, I, I believe that in God's, in God's design, we can find our purpose. Let's start, Genesis 1.1. Um, this is what it says, the very beginning of the book. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. Let's pray. Father, we are, um, Lord, we're grateful today that we get to gather around your word. Lord, I pray that you would use this word, your good design, and that you would shape us with it. Um, Lord, we are called to, to create. Lord, we're called to make something good out of this world, but we cannot do that outside of a relationship with you, Lord. So I pray that you would show us that today. Reveal that to us, Lord, and then show us how you have called us into, that you have sent us into this world, Lord, to be your ambassadors and to create with you. Um, Father, we love you. Uh, be, be in this time that we have this morning. In your name, amen. So we all have different encounters with the creation narrative. I don't know where you first heard it. It's probably one of the most popular, if not the most popular story in all of scripture. Um, oftentimes you first hear it from your parents, your grandparents, a felt board on Sunday morning, some kind of cartoon. It just kind of like weaves its way in some way into all of our culture. And I, I, I think I, I began to ask the question, and it's probably a question that we've all asked when we look at these stories. It's a fair question is, why does it matter? Like, why does it matter? Why does it change anything? If, if that's true, why, how does that impact the way that I go throughout my life today? The first thing that I want us to see in the creation narrative in, in Genesis 1-1, or the very first four words that were said, um, is that in the beginning, God. And the very first point that we're going to see is that God created a good world. God created a good world. So it says, in the beginning, God. And that's significant. It's significant almost because of what it doesn't say. It doesn't say, in the beginning, man. It doesn't say, in the beginning, the world. It doesn't even say, in the beginning, nothing or space. Um, it says, in the beginning, God. Which means that from the beginning of Scripture, there's this fundamental truth this, this platform that we can stand on that should shape who we are and shape our understanding of the rest of the book. It says, in the beginning, God. It means that everything comes from God. And another way to say that is that without, with, without God, there would be nothing. The way that John, one of Jesus' disciples, says it is 
in John 1 verse 3. It says, all things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. What's happening is that we are receiving a source. God is the source. We think about source in a lot of different terms in our world. One of the ways that we refer to source is kind of like in the news where you say you hear a story and you're like, okay, so what are your sources? And what we're actually saying in that moment is, so tell me the validity of where this is coming from so that I can accurately measure, understand, and apply what you're telling me. You're looking for truth. What's your source? Another way that we say that is, what's your life truth? So what is your source in life? Basically, what we're asking is what kind of relationships, what kind of life circumstances, what kind of events have shaped you in a way that there has come out of that a guiding truth in your life? It's become for you a source. And what scripture is saying is that God is that source from the very beginning, that he is the beginning that he's the one that everything comes from and eventually flows to. He's the one that is truth. And what we see in creation is that that ultimately means that that's not only true for all of God's creation, but that's also true for us as individuals. We're already beginning to answer that question is, what were you made for? What was your purpose? Immediately following those first four Word. So we have in the beginning God, the next word that said is that he created. So let's look at f- just the first day. It's, it says in the beginning God created. He created everything. He created the world. It says in the beginning God created the heavens, the earth. The earth was without form and void. Then darkness was over the face of the deep. That the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And then God says, let there be light. And there's light. And then God says that the light was good. And so then he brings order and he begins to separate the light from the darkness. And then he gives names. He speaks names and he says that this is going to be called day and this is going to be called night. And then there is also order in that we still function out of where he says, and that was morning and there was evening on the first day. And what we see all throughout the creation story is those same things that God creates, that he creates something good. He creates sea and he creates the land. He creates plants that yield fruit and seed. He creates the sun. He creates the moon. He creates the stars. It actually says that he places the stars in the sky, that he creates the ocean. He creates the dry land. And then it says that he causes the ocean to swarm, to swarm with living creatures, that there would be also creatures that fly in the sky, that there would be creatures that he makes that are on the earth. And then he also creates us. So what do you see in that? I don't know. Again, I I don't know your experience with the creation narrative, but what do you see when you hear all that? I can tell you what I see. I see power. I see precision. I see order that comes from chaos. I see life and I see growth. I see creation that is perfectly balanced and designed for human flourishing. We see a lot of different things, but I think what jumps off the page as you read this story is that you see something that's good. Seven times, seven times in Genesis 1, the word good is used. My daughter, and man, she's, she's growing up so quickly. Um, my oldest daughter, Annabeth, is six years old, which is crazy to even say. Um, but, you know, we live in a row home in Philly, and so you spend a lot of time together just because the house is tight. It's a small space. Um, we often find ourselves talking in the kitchen. And just like two weeks ago, I was serving her pizza bagels, which is a, is a fan favorite in the house, um, as it should be. And she, uh, she stopped and she asked me, now this, to me, this is crazy because it just shows that God is in and working through everything, including her heart. And it almost seems too spot on. I almost didn't share because I was like, that's just like, that's exactly what we're talking about. But she said, dad, how do you know what's good? 
And I was like, what do you mean? And she said, well, oftentimes, like you say, she doesn't say often, but she said a lot of times you say that something's good or something's bad. And how do you know? And I'm like, yo, that's deep. First of all, <laughs> like, wow. Um, but I got really excited because I was studying for this and thinking about this. And I'm just like overjoyed with the idea that, you know what? It's the very first time that I get to explain to her that God's moving in her heart, that I get to look at her and say, you know what? Daddy doesn't know what's good. And you're like, what do you mean? And she's like, Pfft. she's like, and I, on my own, I am not the one that determines what is good. And the only way, if you get anything out of today, the only way that we know at all what is good is through knowing God. That's it. Without God, there would be nothing. Without God, there would certainly be nothing good. Without God, if God would have left us, we would have no way to know what is good. What this does is it provides these, these, these parameters for us where we get to experience and enjoy the goodness of God that it's not only said in his creation, but just like, man, like an arrow, it shoots all throughout scripture that you see the goodness of God display. There's this way that God has designed for things to flourish that are, that are for our good and ultimately for his glory. And it's not because we have somehow evolved into knowing that what is good and what is, what is, not, what is not good. What happens is God happens. He sets what is good he sets what is not good, and he communicates to that, that to us through Jesus, and that we can know it through knowing him. That's it. God is the one that determines what is good. David is obsessed with this idea. First Chronicles 16.34 says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Psalm 34.8 says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Psalm 33, 5 says, He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of goodness of the Lord. And then Psalm 143, 10, this is maybe my favorite one, where he says, Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Your spirit is good. Lead me in the land of uprightness. Ultimately, the pinnacle of all of this creation is man doesn't mean that we are at the center of it. We're not. God is at the center of this. But in God's creative design, he created us to be different. So the second thing that I want you to see is that God created you in his image. If the first thing is that God created a good world, the second thing is that God created you in his image. We're going to jump a couple verses and we're going to go to verse 26. So we're still in Genesis 1. Verse 26 says this. It says, Then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. What does that mean? That we are made in the image of God. I think when I was a, when I was a kid, the very first time that I heard that, I thought, well, I guess that means that God has human-like features. Um, I guess that means that God has a nose, eyes, and ears. Um, and... I know that Jesus does at one point take on, God takes on human flesh in Jesus, but what God is speaking about here is that he made us to be like him. So there's this identity that's at the heart of this. It's who you are. I thought about it like the way that my son Marcus looks like me. I think that's a natural way to think about it, but there's something far greater than just our physical appearance here. I'll give you three things. The first thing that is that he create us, created us with specific attributes that are separate and unique from the rest of creation. So we have things like personality and rationality, spirituality, morality, the capacity for kindness, compassion, anger, love, mercy, just to name a few. 
And all of these are so that we could be in relationship with God, in relationship with one another. We relate to each other differently than the rest of creation relates to each other. And all of these are also that we could understand who God is and be in relationship with him. We relate to God differently than animals do. We just, we just do. I, when I go to, when I put my girls down at night, if we had a dog, I wouldn't then go and put the dog down and say, hey, you really need to pray about your sins tonight. You know, we need to talk about like your relationship with the Lord. That doesn't make any sense. It's because there's a different value. There's a different attributes. God created us unique. And I think the second thing is value, that we have a different kind of value. Um, Megan and I had, I don't know if a lot of people know this, even our people um, at Bedrock, that we had a dog at one point. Um, his name was Collins. He's a great little dog. But then we had a kid, um, and Annabeth. And Annabeth, we absolutely love her, but she cried a lot. And those first three months were like, they were like pushed us to the edge. <laughs> they were like, oh man, yeah, she cried a lot. Um, we look back on it now and, you know, obviously we laugh about it, but um, they were tough. And our mother and father-in-law at one point said, hey, uh, you want us to take the dog um, just to watch it for the weekend? We're like, yeah, yeah, that'd be great. I think they could sense that we were kind of struggling. And um, a weekend turned into a week and then it turned into a month and it turned into a year. Now that dog has a permanent new home. And you're like, oh man, that's like, I mean, that's unfortunate, but like, if I were to say that I did that with my children, you would be like, that's crazy. And the reason that that's crazy for you is because there's, there's a different kind of value that is placed upon a human life. Like, like there's an imprint of God on human life that's just, it's unique. And I think whether you're a follower of Jesus, whether you believe in the Bible or not, this is something that we sense. Like we get this as people. I think our laws even protect people differently than they protect like plants and animals because ultimately we recognize that man th there's a certain value on human life that's unique i think it's one of the reasons that every time that we ever see value like human life um devalued that we're offended by that whether it's racial issues whether it's pornography or whatever it is even if it's um even, even if it's just someone being um, devalued or their dignity being taken away from them in a single moment. You're like, man, that's wrong. That's not okay. And you don't need to be a follower of Jesus to see that. I think what you see in scripture is that it explains why we feel that way is because God created us, that there was a design and there was a different kind of value that was placed on human life in all of creation. The third thing that we see is that we have a different role. We have a different role in creation. We, we can, we govern and we manage and we take care of creation in a completely different way. Like, again, if you were to think about a, a dog, like if, if we had a dog right now and I, I were to look at him and be like, man, I've told you, put your toys away. Like you, your toys are all over the house, put the toys away. You'd be like, that's crazy, he's a dog. <laughs> Like he doesn't have the capacity to, to manage those things. You don't expect him to manage those things. But I look at my children and I'm like, I'm teaching you to put away your toys, to take care of the space that you've been given. Even early on as a parent, you're training them because it's been instilled in you, not from your parents, but from, from the Lord, that there is, a, there is a responsibility to take care of the world that we've been given. And you don't expect that from the rest of creation. We're unique in that sense. So to be created in the image of God is a unique thing, but it also, it also explains a little bit of that original question that we asked, which is, what are we made for? And what we see ultimately is that part of that imaging God and, and being in his likeness was also creating as he created. Which brings me to my final point. God is creating a good world through you. Our original question was, what was I made for? And I think it's worth noting in, in the very beginning, when God creates this world, he creates Adam, he places him in a garden, and his very first instruction to him was to work. In Genesis 2.15, it says, The Lord took the man and he put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. And I think, um, I think you're, you know, part of us immediately just kind of like has a hard time with that because we know what work can mean for us. 
And we could very quickly be like, man, I, I feel like I live to work right now and it's not great. So if you're about to tell me that the purpose of my life is that I can work, I'm not here for it. And I completely understand that. But hear me out. This word work actually means cultivate. Um, and the picture that we get is the garden with Adam. And so at the core of it, what he's telling Adam to do is to create which to me is incredible that God would create this whole world, create Adam, place him in the garden, and then also, because he's an image bearer of God, tell him to create. Now you create. And I think it's, it's incredible that that's part, that is exactly what God has designed us for. But the problem is, um, is that through Adam, sin also, also enters the world, it fractures God's good design. And I think one of the things that we can see all throughout creation is, and honestly, the way that we live our lives is that you can actually carry out this mandate without having any kind of relationship with God. Is that you can wake up every day, deny the existence of a creator, and carry out this call to create. You can create at your job, you can create in your home, you can create in your block, in your communities, in your city, there's this thing in us that is just natural for us to go out and make something of the world that we have been given. We do this, but we do it in a broken way. And so this is what happens, that we create things. And, then, and we find ourselves questioning that while there are so many good things in this world, so many good things that come out of what God is creating, and honestly, that come out of our own hands, it, there's still this brokenness. There's pain, and there's anxiety, and there's fears. Um, there's death, and ultimately, we find ourselves thinking, why? Like, it just feels like there's something that has infected all of creation, and there is, and it's that broken relationship. It's sin that entered the world. And so God, God, from the very beginning, has taken a step towards us. The moment that sin enters the world, God takes a step towards us. And the whole story, the whole narrative from beginning to end has this one common theme of God restoring all of creation, including us, back to himself. We see it primarily in Jesus. Everything points either forward to Jesus or back to Jesus. It's ultimately all about the sacrifice that Jesus makes, but we see Jesus step into a world. We see him step into a world that already has a culture, but he doesn't succumb to that culture. What he does is he carries out the mandate and the, the will of the Father and that Father and that he creates. He creates something new. He creates something good. He creates a world the way that God has always designed it to be. And he does, he does so through healing. He does so through love. He does so through protecting and forgiving and defending and serving. And ultimately, he does so through sacrifice. It's the spirit of God that's working through Jesus to create something the way that it was always made to be. So through Jesus, we can see a creation that is perfect and it's good. But we can't do that alone. You see, we still have this broken relationship with God, but Jesus says that through him that you can have a relationship with the Father. That's the core message, core principle of the life of Christ and, and all of Scripture is that God's recreating things and he's recreating it through Jesus. And he's made a way for us to know him, to know what is good and have a relationship with him through Jesus, through his life, death, and his resurrection and believing in him and placing our hope in him. And as we do that, it actually says that the spirit that worked through God also works through us. Romans 8 verse 10 says this, it says, But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So there's this spirit that produces good things, the fruits of the Spirit, which is Galatians 5.22. It says that it's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. And these are just some of the things that the Spirit produces in us. And this is key. This is extremely important. I know that we all walk, um, we see these different ideas and ways to live life. And, 
it's it's important for us to understand that this cr- Christianity and um, scripture, it's not another ideology. It's not another idea to throw into and amongst all the other ideas that we see. What it is, and what I hope you see in this message is that it's an identity. It changes you. And I think, and it, we're eager to look for a checklist of like, okay, so if I'm going to create this culture, then I guess I need to do this, 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 and this. And the whole story of scripture is you can't do that. And so what we see in Jesus is that the only way that that happens is through the Spirit working through us. That's it. It's God working through us. And so your concern is this, in this is, do I know God? Do I have a relationship with, with God? Do I have, have I given my life? Do I believe in Jesus? Is the Spirit working through me? And out of that, that fruit that we see, like those good things, those are going to naturally overflow out of you and you will be creating in everything that you do. You'll be creating in your jobs, in your communities, in your city, in the places that you go, in the places that you relax, and honestly, even in your work. And in a place that for you may be a difficult place to be, God is going to use the Spirit in you to change it. There's a new level, there's a new kind of truth that you now function out of, and what it creates is an entirely new culture. So we're, 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 sa- we're sent here, we're placed here to create something that's completely new, but we can't do it alone. See, what it is is that God's creating a restored and new world through us. So this is the way that Jesus says it in the end, in Matthew Chapter six, starting in verse nine, when they asked Jesus, okay, so, all right, so how do we pray? If we have a relationship with the Father, how do we speak to the Father? This is what he said. He said, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. What we see there is a relationship with the Father, and we see this promise of a kingdom. You know, in Scripture, we talk a lot about the church. We're a young church, um, and we're going to talk about what that means for us. But what we see with Jesus is he talks a lot about the kingdom, that the kingdom's coming, and he's come to usher in that kingdom. That is what we're partaking in. We're partaking in this kingdom, this new kingdom this restored kingdom that God is bringing and one day he will bring to completion. We get to partake in that together. If you have any questions about that, you can, um, you can send us a text at the number that we said. Um, you could also DM us on our Instagram. We'd love to talk to you, um, share a cup of coffee, really just introduce ourselves. We're so excited about what it means for us to create a new culture here in Fishtown. Um, let's pray together. Father, uh, we understand completely that this culture that we desire to create is something that um, it's set by you. Um, it's seen in your creation. It's a good, your good creation. Lord, that there is brokenness that enters the world, Lord, and that we partake in that brokenness, but in the same way that we can also partake in restoration that's offered to us through Jesus Christ. So Lord, I pray if there's anyone here today that hasn't been restored in that way, that they wouldn't look to creating a culture as something that Lord, that they can achieve on their own, but they would see that, Lord, that flows through you. Like you are the one that's creating through us. And so that I pray that first and foremost, that there would be a restored relationship between you and your children. Lord, that you came to seek and to save the lost. And um, Lord, we're grateful for the work that Jesus has done. Lord, I pray that you would create that through us. Change Fishtown, bring your kingdom here. Um, Lord, change the city of Philadelphia for your glory. Uh, We love you in your name. Amen.